This is Arab Talk on KPOO 89.5 FM in San Francisco. This is Arab Talk with Jess and Jamal, and I'm Jess Khan Nam. And I'm Jamal Dejani. Jamal, there's really some incredible news that we're going to be talking about today, and we're going to focus on Palestine and Saudi Arabia and the Middle East. If there's time, we may get to other things, but... The real big news in terms of Palestine this last week has been the ICC ruling that they actually do have jurisdiction over assessing and taking on claims of war crimes uh, committed by the state of Israel and their military. This is truly um, a big step in some kind of accountability. That's what we've been talking about for many, many months, if not years and decades in terms of Israel's pass on the international stage to commit war crimes without accountability. And now we have, for the first time, uh, a ruling by the ICC that they do, in fact, have jurisdiction to uh, assessing those claims of war crimes. It's a big deal. That's right, Jess. And we have the right expert to talk right. about it. <laughs> and of course, the, the ruling uh, by the ICC in The Hague is uh, six years in the making, you right. know, so it's not something new that uh, they've been trying to get it uh, there, and Israel has been uh, stalling and, 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 and playing all kinds of games, but eventually the ruling came. However, uh, um, and this is what uh, our expert I should introduce, uh, which is uh, Diana Butu, uh, she cautions that, uh, you know, there are a lot of, uh, there might be a lot of delays uh, proceeding with this. And also, uh, you have to remember that this is a very narrow ruling because right. it only talks about the actions of Israel and its atrocities during the devastating 50-day uh, Gaza war of 2014. It doesn't go all the way back to the Nakba, the ethnic cleansing uh, and what happened in 1967, all these things. So it's, it's really very narrow. Uh, let's watch and, and listen to Diana. Last week, the International Criminal Court determined that it has jurisdiction over the territories occupied by Israel in 1967, despite Israel's insistence to the contrary, opening the way for an inquiry into allegations of Israeli war crimes in the region. The ruling by the ICC in The Hague came six years after the office of the court's chief prosecutor, Fatou Ben Souda, began a preliminary investigation of Israeli actions in the territories, including during the devastating 50-day Gaza War of 2014. Joining us from Palestine to discuss this and more, Diana Bhutto, former legal advisor to Palestine Liberation Organization Chairman Mahmoud Abbas, and Palestinian negotiators. Welcome again to Arab Talk, Diana. Thank you, Jamal. Thanks for having me. So uh, the ruling took six years. First, why did it take this long and how significant is this ruling? Look, the reason it took so long was because um, you should recall that this, that wasn't the first step, that the 2015 application actually wasn't the first step. There is actually it predates all of that back to many, many years ago to the first Israeli attack on the Gaza Strip in 2008 and 2009. And at that time, the, the prosecutor who was then in place um, was somebody who decided that he was going to kick the can down the line to the next uh, to the next prosecutor. And so he did. And when he kicked the can down to the next line to the next prosecutor, um, this, this, this prosecutor first decided that Palestine would have to go through a whole bunch of legal hoops in order to be eligible. And then after going through all those hoops, made the decision that there was jurisdiction. And it was that decision that uh, Israel was opposed to and it was then, then taken to the court for a, for a final ruling. Now, the reason that it's taken so long is because this is such a political issue. And the ICC, at the end of the day, is a political court. This isn't a, a court just like you would go to a, a normal court of law and get a ruling. This involves countries. It involves powerful countries. And it is for this reason that we saw that the first prosecutor, 
um, kicked it down to the next prosecutor. And this prosecutor doesn't have much time left. So I don't I don't think that we're going to see any change from now until the end of her term. Wow. So you think they're going to just like delay that uh, to see if someone else is more in favor of Israel will get appointed or uh, I don't know if it's an appointment or an election, but is that the case? No, I don't think that's what's going to happen. I just think that for these prosecutors, it's it's much more politically sound for them to deal with other issues than to deal with Israel. Just in the same way that uh, if you look at Europe or if you or if you look at Canada, let's leave aside the United States, um, that other all these other countries are happy to deal with with other issues and not deal with the big elephant in the room, which is Israel and Israeli war crimes. Um, so instead, they'll focus on other countries around the world rather than actually focusing on what it is that Israel is doing. And so too, when it comes to the prosecutor, um, I believe that the next prosecutor is also going to do the same thing. Now, that being said, Jamal, I, I think there's some things about this that are important. The first is that, um, that this is a decision and, and it does say that Israel can be held to account. So that part is good. Here's the bad to it, uh, though, which isn't just the fact that it's, it may take years if we ever see it at all. It's that Palestinians are constantly being placed in a position where we have to jump through hoops to in order to be able to prove our humanity to the world. I mean, do we really need an international court to come forward and say that bombing um, schools in the Gaza Strip is illegal, to say that bombing civilians in the Gaza Strip is illegal, to say that stealing land for, for the, the construction of homes for one group of people only um, is illegal, that denying freedom to, to entire people is, is illegal. Do we really need a court to say that, particularly in the 21st century? And the problem is, is that the world is saying yes, not only do we do we need a court to say that, but you have to fit within these narrow confines in order for the court to say that. And one of the thing, one of the narrow confines is that we're not talking about holding Israel to account for all of the things that it's done, the Nakba, the Nexi, and so on. Um, but we're only talking about very discrete elements of Israeli racist policy, apartheid, ethnic cleansing, rather than on uh, the, the broad picture as a whole. For example, we will never get to the ICC to, to discuss Israel's treatment of Palestinians who are citizens of this of uh, who are citizens of the state. You know, the state came to came to them; they didn't come to the state. Um, we will never get the ICC to focus on what happened during the Nakba. We will never get the ICC to focus on the, the tens of thousands of home demolitions that happened before, uh, before 2015. These are all issues that, that um, the world has said to us, you need to move on. And quite frankly, um, I don't think that Israel should be getting a pass when it comes to this. You're absolutely right. I mean, this is you know, just to, to make it clear, it's a very uh, narrow target, which is re which really deals with the uh, latest atrocity or one of the latest atrocities which happened in Gaza. But you can't go back to the Nakba, you cannot go back to the Naksa and, 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 and many other things. Yet um, Israel's prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, who is facing problems of his own in, in court, assailed the International uh, Criminal Court for its ruling, calling such a probe pure anti-Semitism, and I, I quote from him here, he said, uh, when the ICC investigates Israel for fake war crimes, this is pure anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. If Israel did not commit uh, war crimes, what are they afraid of? Exactly. I mean, this is exactly the point. You know, Jemena, it's very interesting um, to, to compare and contrast what the South Africans were saying at, during the period of apartheid and what Israel is saying. So during the period of South African apartheid, uh, when there were attempts to go to international to the International Court of Justice to try to to uh, hold is uh, to try to hold South Africa to account, one of the things that the uh, apartheid leaders kept coming forward and saying is only South African apartheid, only the, the courts of apartheid South Africa can can hold. Uh, South Africa to account. And similarly, you see the same line 
that is coming out from Netanyahu, from Rivlin, from virtually all of the Israeli political establishment, which is saying that only Israel can hold Israel to account. And anything that is beyond that, they of course label as anti-Semitic because that's the new weapon of choice. So um, this is something that this has long been the strategy that they have that they've had and they'll continue to have. And of course, to add good measure, he pulled out yet another one of the Zionist te techniques, which is to then start pointing fingers at other countries and saying that the ICC is somehow obsessed with Israel when it should be obsessed with all of these other countries. I mean, these are very tried and tested Zionist tactics, tried and tested Netanyahu tactics. And the real issue is whether the world is going to continue to fall for it. And my fear is that, of course, they will, because even though we have this, this ruling, which is simply one step and only one step, um, the road ahead of us is definitely long. And I'm, I'm certain that there's going to be a lot of political pressure brought to bear to make sure that none of these cases are heard. Yeah, but uh, I was reading, like, I think on Sunday in the Israeli paper Haaretz and just you're on the ground, so you know more than I do now, uh, just uh, monitoring this remotely, that uh, hundreds of senior Israeli security officials, uh, past and present, uh, are expected to be called in for briefings, fearing uh, that, they're, that they may, may be arrested abroad. Uh, uh, so there is like some kind of, I don't want to call it labor it panic, but... They're taking precautions. And then one of the other things that kind of drew attention for me is that, according to the report, that uh, member states, ICC member states, have agreed to give advance warning to Israel if any intent to arrest Israelis on their arrival in those countries. I mean, is that fair game? I mean, let's say if this, is, if this was going to happen, that now... If an Israeli official was going to be traveling to Germany or France or wherever, they'll give them a warning. I mean, do you do you give warnings to a criminal before arresting them? Obviously not. But you know, Israel in the eyes of Europe is very special, and uh, and this is again the problem is that um, no matter what we do, no matter what what path we take, they're always telling us that it's the wrong path unless that path is negotiations, and that's it. So you, you know, I also want to. Um, take us back uh, some 15 years as well, or actually a little bit more, 17 years, with the ICJ decision that came out against the, the wall. Now, um, what was significant about that ruling that came out in 2004 is that there's really no difference between what has been said by the prosecutor um, today and what the court has said today at the ICC than what was said at the ICJ. It was all of the same types of statements. They made pronouncements about the illegality of settlements. They made pronouncements about the illegality of the wall and so on. And yet um, at that time in 2004, when that decision came out, there was a lot of diplomatic pressure on, uh, uh, put on Palestinians to not take it further to not hold Israel to account, to not um, make sure that, that even a register with the name of companies was created. I mean, all of this pressure has been brought to bear on Palestinians. And so the, what we're left with is they, the world community tells us that we can't resist violently. The world community, community tells us that we can't resist by going, by going uh, through legal courts. Uh, because the ICC is, is problematic or the ICJ is problematic. The, the world community also tells us that we can't resist nonviolently through BDS. In effect, the only thing that the world community is accepting is this flawed process of negotiations, and that's it. And here is why, and that is the reason why we see that they're going to do anything in their power to make sure that Israel's given a heads up, to make sure that Israel's not held to account, because at the end of the day, they don't care for us. They don't support us. Um, they pay us lip service. They pay lip service to the idea of international law. But that's it. What they really want to see is our continued subjugation. If they didn't want to see that, then they would have ended it a long time ago. I'm sensing, and, and justifiably so from you, uh, that you're not that optimistic. 
uh, about this uh, ICC uh, ruling. Uh, yet, uh, I noticed a lot of celebrations in in Palestinian media and people like thinking this is going to be the answer to all their problems, but that's not the case. No, no, don't get me wrong. I'm happy. I'm happy that this came out. I'm happy that that these steps are taking place, and I'm happy that uh, that we are, you know, perhaps one step closer. My my skepticism is that I know that the way that the legal system works, um, I know how long they can just keep so a, a case stuck in the wheel for for years and years and years, and I ex- anticipate that this is going to happen. But more than that, my frustration with all of this is that I'm angry with the fact that we in the 21st century still have to jump through all of these hoops to prove to the world that we have the right to live in our to live in freedom on our homeland. That's the part that frustrates me is that the the world community says to us you have in order to be able to bring a case you have to declare state. Well, why do I, why do I have to declare statehood just to fit within your narrow definition of uh, of what a war crime is? Do we actually need that in this day and age? Do we really need to have a, a court come forward and say demolishing an entire village is illegal? Do we need a court to actually say that? Or doesn't our own humanity tell us that this is illegal? Shifting gears here, uh, last week we had on our show Israeli activist Rani Barkan, uh, who said that Israel is practicing medical apartheid when it comes to providing COVID-19 vaccines to Palestinians, and that big pharma companies like Pfizer and others are culprits what are your thoughts on this? I think he's absolutely right. You know, the medical apartheid is such a stark example of how you have within this one land that is controlled entirely by Israel, these two sets of standards that there are, there's one um, group that is, in, that is able to get the vaccine and then another that, um, that is not uh, without there even being a discussion of how it is that they're going to give Palestinians the vaccine or get the vaccine to Palestinians, not necessarily them administering, but getting it to Palestinians. And this is why, uh, Jaman, language matters. You know, for such a long time, the Israelis have gone through this process of trying to erase the word occupation. And we see it very clearly trying to be erased, not only by Israelis, but sometimes within the media itself. It's rare that we hear the term occupation or occupied. And the reason that this matters is that because Palestinians are living under military occupation, under military rule, Israel owes obligations. They have an obligation to Palestinians to make sure that medical needs are met. And instead, what they do is they practice medical apartheid, not just when it comes to COVID and and the vaccine, but all throughout history. For example, um, if if a person wants to get, needs to get, any type of radiation therapy, um, whether that person is residing in the West Bank or the Gaza Strip. And so, for example, breast cancer is one of the cancers that can be radiated. They actually need to get a permit to go get treated either outside of the country or in a hospital inside 48 inside Israel. And the reason is, is because Israel practices medical apartheid. They will not allow any radiation equipment into the West Bank or into the Gaza Strip. And so this issue of medical apartheid, it's not new. It's just been brought to light since uh, since the pandemic and since the providing of the, since the vaccine has been been rolled out. Um, And so we see it very clearly now, but it's always been there. And uh, in terms of the companies that are involved in this, their, their response is always the same, which is that um, they're simply providers, they're not the ones who are doing the administering and so on and so forth. And yet it's, it's really shocking to me that we don't see that there is more pressure being brought to bear on Israel by um, countries around the world and by these, that by these companies to make sure that Palestinians are given equal access. You know, the, the, as you know, the virus doesn't distinguish between Christian and Muslim, between uh, Jewish and, and uh, Muslim or Christian doesn't distinguish between 
um, Israeli or Palestinian or settler or or it just doesn't distinguish. And yet the way that the is the Israelis are administering it is entirely to distinguish between them. Well, don't you think also this, uh, I mean, the companies are, are really res more responsible because they're giving the vaccine for free to Israel. Yes. And Israel is being used almost like as an experiment or as a study because it can administer the vaccine uh, fairly quickly. You know, it has a good healthcare system and also uh, because of its, uh, the population. And I mean, are they ignorant that they are ignoring, I mean, Israel controls the land between the Mediterranean Sea and, 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 and the Jordan River, that they are basically ignoring more than half the population or at least half the population. Yes, yes. And I, I want to be clear, Jamal, um, the reason that there's been such a successful or a, a, such a quick um, vaccination campaign is, is for two reasons. Um, one is because the medical system it predates the state and it's been a medical system that has been efficient and working before the state. Um, but secondly, is that this is actually a police state, it's a security state. And what that means is that um, at any point in time, the, the state can track you and they have been tracking Palestinians, pre again, predating COVID. Um, and so it's for this reason that they've had this effective system because they're able to constantly track you and to, to make sure that you know and to send you reminders and so on and so forth. So it's a system that isn't as, um, you know, it isn't as, as glorious or people, people are making it out to, to, to be. It's, it's because of these, these, this security apparatus um, that we see that this is being administered so quickly. Um, and that's not to say the security apparatus is a good thing at all. It's just to explain why that this is happening so quickly and why it potentially is not happening so quickly in other in other uh, countries where they don't have the same level of um, state uh, state uh, scrutiny and, and, and so maybe on. I just should explain a little bit more about this because uh, you're right. I've been uh, I mean in contact with uh, people on the ground and. Like I have uh, former colleagues and friends who said that they got a text message, for example, saying that they were came in contact with someone who was right. infected with COVID and they must self-quarantine for two weeks and, right. and that they tracked them through their cell phone, right? That's exactly what happened. I've received the same. So um, things like uh, being able to know where you are at any point in time because of your cell phone, your cell phone is linked to... Uh, the equivalent of your social security number. Um, and so they're able to track both through your, through your, your cell phone um, in terms of where you actually are and also able to link that cell phone to your, your personal ID number, which is the equivalent of your social security number. So this is, they have been able, I've been one of the people who's received one of these messages telling me to, uh, that I may have been in contact with somebody and to, to get a test or go into quarantine depending on how long they thought I was with this person. Um, so that's the way that the that this um, that this system is is playing itself out. Well, uh, on this note, uh, Diane, I want to thank you again for your time, and hope to talk to you very soon. I hope so too. Thank you, Jamal. Thanks for your time. That's the uh, voice of uh, and face of uh, Diana Butu, um, international law expert. Um, giving a very compelling and very thoughtful analysis of the ICC ruling, Jamal. And I think you hit it right, and she really beautifully elaborated. You know, the good news is that the ICC can, in fact, take this on. It's not really bad news, but as as she said, it's a very narrow ruling. But isn't there the possibility that even though this may take some time, and um, it's a narrow ruling now. It does set the stage potentially for other cases being brought before the ICC on behalf of uh, Palestinians in Palestine. Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, you know, as she mentioned, uh, this was a victory, but it needs a lot of work. It's going to take many years. It's, uh, I mean, because... A lot of people are celebrating justifiably a lot of Palestinians who have been waiting for, for this day saying finally after six years the ICC said it has jurisdiction. But this is really the first step of many 
steps to come. But it, it's important because uh, the other thing that uh, Di Diane and I talked about is that Israel has been now warning or briefing some of its generals and politicians who may be subject to this ruling and subject to arrest if this proceeds further. So they're also taking it seriously. They're, of course, uh, with, you know, the other thing is we didn't talk about is the United States is against this ruling. I mean, this is the double standard. And then and then now they're going back and saying, well, the Israel is not a, a signatory on the ICC, you know, it's not part of the ICC. But this means just nothing because it doesn't mean that if you don't accept the ICC or you're not part of the ICC club that you are not going to be charged and and you know uh, brought to court right i and mean all criminals you know taking it all the way back they never were part of the ICC or didn't accept the ICC right. yet it had jurisdiction over the so cases in the country a couple of things it could mean though that some israeli officials could be arrested if they travel internationally depending on how this all kind of sorts out and that would be a huge huge um step toward accountability and you know i think that's really great but you kind of touched on something, Jamal, which is worth a few minutes of, of discussing. The timing of the ICC announcing this after the Trump administration, I don't think, is a random thing. Because certainly if this had been announced during the four years of the Trump administration, they would have done, as they did, everything in their power to kind of put pressure on the ICC not to come to this decision. Now we're in the Biden administration. And this is the first test of the Biden administration's so-called attempt to be, you know, a more even-handed um, kind of partner in what's happening in Palestine. So, you know, we'll just have to see whether or not the Biden administration can step up with something like this. That's right. And also whether uh, they change their attitude as far as... Uh always shielding Israel. And we know from past history with all administrations, from the Obama administration until the end, with the exception of one uh, time when the Obama administration- They didn't did veto. Not, they yeah. did not veto. So that's the only time. Do you have so a the prediction quick, on the, quick, that? Do you have a prediction? Short, well, the short answer, the Biden administration all already said that this is unfair and, and so forth. You know, they've already, kind of uh, issued the boilerplate statement defending Israel. But they may know. not put the pressure behind the scenes to yeah, stop it. That, exactly. So that we, we'll have to wait and see, right? So we'll have to wait and see. Now, talking about this, I want to shift gear a little bit to another case, uh, just which is um, Saudi Arabia. Right. And we saw an immediate change. That's right. I don't say 100% change. And, and this is, uh, I guess we can talk about the latest case in Saudi Arabia, which is the, uh, the, um, the activist, the Saudi Arabian women's rights activist, uh, Lujain Al-Hathloul, who basically was, has been in jail for the past 1,000 days in Saudi jail. And so her family today uh, thanked uh, President Joe Biden, literally a day after she was released from Saudi jail and urged continued international pressure on the Saudi regime. So, Huge. so yeah, so what we know, of course, what we know, and we've talked about this case here, she's been in jail for the past 1,000 days. So Saudi Arabia released her yesterday and although she remains on probation for three years, meaning that she is under a travel ban and restriction for the next five years, that's according to her family. She was arrested in May 2018, along with several other female activists openly calling for women's rights, basically among them the right to drive. Of course, since then, uh, the ban on women driving in the country was lifted in 2000. 18, and then her detention came amid a sweeping cr uh, crackdown uh, by uh, no other than Crown Prince 
Mohammed bin Salman and, and, and uh, you know, uh, basically saying that she's conspiring or against the security of the country. Some some drummed up charges. The interesting thing, just uh, I mean, no one. I mean, the the European Union has been asking for her release. The Trump ad- administration did not forward. No, they did didn't. not put her. You know, they um, could care you know, less. They couldn't care less. But definitely, the European Union, human rights organizations all over the world, they have been asking for her release. Her family says uh, say that uh, she was subjected to torture, electric shocks, sexual harassment, and, and other things. This is what uh, actually coming from uh, human rights groups. Uh, they also said other women in Saudi Arabia faced the same thing. And it didn't take much for the Biden administration. And that's what I'm saying, the change here. I mean, uh, President Biden, you know, has been on the job since January 20th of this this year, where uh, February 11th, they got her out quickly. A strong message was sent to them because if you want to have any, ch- you know, if we're going to go back uh, to normality or semi-normality, you better take care of this case and, and they let her go. Right, Jamal. But let's also say that uh, the Biden administration did also something very important last week. They also cut support for the Saudi uh, devastation and, uh, you know, war on uh, Yemen, and they've taken the Houthis off of the terrorism watch list. So in my mind, these are two really good, three really good um, uh, decisions by the Biden administration to put the Saudi Arabian monarchy on notice that this is not the Trump administration We're not going to tolerate war crimes that you're committing against uh, Yemenis, whomever they may be. And if you, you know, want to play, you know, international ball with the United States, you have to, you know, take heed under these three things that they they did. I will say, though, Jamal, this is low hanging fruit, you know, in terms of international diplomatic relations. There have been atrocities committed in Yemen by the Saudis and by the Emirates. And so to stop the plane sales to the Emirates, to say to the Saudis, we're no longer going to support this, to take the Houthis off of the watch list, and to have this uh, Saudi uh, human rights activist uh, released from jail is great news, but it should be only the beginning. This is the low-hanging fruit. We haven't heard anything about what's going to happen with uh, Jamal Khashoggi yet and that whole devastation. So there's a, I would say, okay. Good first opening, good first move, but there's a long way to go with Saudi Arabia, Jamal. You and I know that. Yeah, and uh, and and well, the action was quick, so that we we can say this, and we will will keep monitoring it. Now, the question is why we brought this case, you know, and this kind of came back to back to the ICC ruling, right? right. So now uh, the United States and the, or the Biden administration shifts its attention to Saudi Arabia, but it does not, for example, you know, take the side of the Palestinians or fights for their human rights or, uh, you know, um, reprimands uh, Israel for its abuses uh, in the occupied uh, West Bank and its siege on Gaza. So... So I feel it's a little bit kind of on a shift of attention also, or a shift of the spotlight from the ICC ruling to say, well, here we're doing something on the human rights front, and it is not what's happening in Palestine, but what's going on in Saudi Arabia internally against its own citizens, like women's rights. That's something, like you said, low-hanging fruit. Everybody will kind of like, uh, line up behind it, you know, I mean, who's going to criticize or who's going to be against Saudi Arabia freeing a, a woman exactly. from jail? No, that's, that's exactly But they're not right. going to touch the Palestinian issue, right? They're not going to come near it. Well, but, but Jamal, this is all going to come to a head, okay? We know that there are uh, factions within the Biden administration and the Biden coalition, as you say, and the progressive elements within his administration, and there are some, and there's very progressive elements within the Congress. We know who those progressives are. They 
will eventually push the issue of Palestine sooner or later. So with all the dynamics going on, Biden will be confronted with a very difficult decision about how he spends his political capital on whether or not he's going to try to, I don't want to say appease the progressive elements, but engage with the more progressive elements of his coalition versus, you know, going in the direction of the more traditional pro-Israel, Israel is always right, you know, J Street, lobby, APAC, even we would call it APAC light even. And we know that Biden has said on many occasions that you don't have to be Jewish to be a Zionist. And so, you know, well, th- this eventually will come to a head. And I think well, it here will. are some of the some of the uh, you're talking about APAC light. And here is some of the uh, what I call subtle and not not so subtle messages, because uh, on one hand, the Secretary of State, the new Secretary of State, was asked um, about moving the embassy to Jerusalem. He didn't change. So he said, yeah, we're not going to change that. So that we know one direction. When he uh, was asked about the Golan Heights, he did not say that Israel can annex. He said, well, that's subject to blah, blah, blah. But basically, he did not affirm uh, so-called right to maintain hold or to annex the Golan Heights. So on Jerusalem, yes, I see it. On the Golan Heights, it's no. He said, well, now, meaning kind of like Syria, serious trouble, we're not going to talk about it now, but maybe later on. So that there, there is a contradiction here right. um, in that statement. The other thing that is kind of, uh, I read more about it in the Israeli news, is Benjamin Netanyahu is perplexed and has been waiting and waiting and waiting for a phone call from Biden, which will eventually will come. But Biden has been busy talking to the Chinese president, which he had a two hour conversation with him. He's been calling other countries, talking to Canada. And usually there is a quick phone call, you know, administration after administration makes that call, I would say within the first week. Now we're coming on a month almost in a week, which will be a month. And that's, I think this is what I call the, the subtle message that the American-Israeli relations will be unchanged in a way, kind of the general kind of standard that the United States will support Israel unrelentlessly. And, but there is a subtle message that uh, Biden does dis- dislikes Netanyahu. Well, absolutely, Jamal. And that's a carryover from the Obama administration. Remember, the last year of the Obama administration, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu uh, did many disrespectful, damaging, uh, really terrible things to Obama to undercut him, and not the least of which is giving a joint presentation to the Congress without you know, consulting the president or taking in to consideration the president's wishes and and respect. I think, you know, one thing about Biden, he is very he's very loyal to Obama still and the Obama legacy. And he feels and understands how disrespectful uh Netanyahu and the Israelis have been to the United States and to uh Barack Obama in particular. I think this is subtle, but it's a very strong message to the Israelis because well, the biggest the biggest actually act of disrespect, just to remind our viewers and listeners, Jess, is and this is actually, I think, important for President Biden, because guess what? He was vice president, right. which means he presided over the Congress, right? The Congress is that when Congress held a joint session and invited Netanyahu to waltz in and give his lofty speech without coordinating with President Obama. I mean, he just kind of flew to New York and from New York to Washington D.C. and just bypassed kind of. Uh, that, that's why Obama. I think it's that's why I think it's a strong, subtle but strong message to Netanyahu and the Israelis because. Let's not forget the other thing, the other calculation that Biden is making right now, and I think it's a good calculation, Jamal, is that this is the weakest Netanyahu has been. This week, his corruption trial started to move forward, and he stormed out of the courtroom this week 
uh, in a fit of rage and anger. So, you know, uh, we know that Netanyahu is kind of weakened right now politically, uh, you know, uh, among Israelis. This is, he's on trial for corruption. I think it really helps. And, you know, Biden is a smart guy, despite being a Christian Zionist, at least claiming to be a Christian Zionist for political reasons. He's a smart guy. He sees that he's a little weak right now. He's not going to call him right away. I think it's really smart, subtle, but smart, but it sends a strong message. You're listening to Arab Talk on KPOO San Francisco, 89.5 FM. And just, I mean, the big elephant in the room, we're not going to ignore this, the impeachment and the second impeachment of Donald Trump. Uh, you and I watched, you know, what happened in, in those preceding, proceedings yesterday and the new videos that were released. So disturbing. Because we were talking about it. This was really, I mean, the vice president of the United States, the former vice president of the United States, uh, Pence, and uh, Cong- all the people, you know, that, who were there, they really dodged the bullet. We yeah, saw how close, yeah. you know, I mean, like before, like now we have the security cameras showing how people were hiding and, and this mob were on a hunt, you know, yeah. hunting for these people, and the, hunting the thing, for Nancy Pelosi, hunting, you know, for, for vice, the vice president. You know, I mean, this was a very, very dangerous situation. You know, Jamal, I mean... I know a little bit about trauma, you know, that's my area of expertise. And one of the things that happened in the last two days, when the Democratic House impeachment manager showed these videos, it re-traumatized, again, all the senators and congressmen and women who were the victims and witnesses to this seditious, treasonous uh, coup d'etat. And yet... um, you, despite that, and despite the fact that, and this is true for trauma, as we know, as time passes, you only begin to fully appreciate how bad, how dangerous, and how serious what happened on January 6th was. And some of them had their families with them, their well, children. Pence did. Their, yeah, Pence they had did. their entire families with them, and, and they were in shock. They thought that they were not going to make it. And then despite all these testimonies that you see people, now they can uh, close up on, uh, on on what they were wearing and carrying those tasers. Uh, they were carrying gas. No, uh, Jamal, they, uh, they, the, bear, the, they had bear, full, whatever, gas. They had full tactical gear. They had bear spray, which is far more toxic than pepper spray or tear One gas. One policeman, I think, had a heart attack because of it. Yeah, but you saw the video of this policeman. And they showed his body cam. It was very disturbing of him being beaten by a flagpole that had the American flag on it, beaten by a hockey hockey stick. I mean, what these videos showed, Jamal, and that we'll get to the political analysis here in a, in, in a second. This was a serious uh, attempt at, um, I still am calling it a coup d'etat, even though other people are, are calling it other things. You know, it was domestic terrorism, but when you seek to undermine a legitimate election of a, of a government and seek to attack the, the seat of that government, that is a coup d'etat, even if it's done by domestic terrorists. We're seeing, as time goes on, how close, as you said, it was to Nancy. I mean, people were shouting, Nancy, where are you? And they were shouting, hang Mike Pence. Um, the senators were terrified. So you put that on one side. That That is the reality. And yet we're probably going to have Jamal because this is the trial. He was impeached a second time. Now this is the trial to see if they can convict him. And the result would be if convicted, he would never be able to run for president again, referring to Donald Trump. You are going to see abject cowardice on the part of forty, at least 45 maybe 40 senators, Republican senators, who despite the evidence, who were the victims of this thing, who are traumatized by it to this day, will refuse to acknowledge and refuse to hold accountable this seditious, treasonous act that Trump poured the gas on and lit the flame for. It's amazing because, 
You're right. I mean, it's good that we that we're seeing this trial. It's good that we're seeing these uh, this footage that we haven't seen before. It's terrible it's good man. To, to hear these testimonies. And yet, you're absolutely right. You're not going to get the number of Republican senators who will vote to basically uh, convict Donald Trump. And so he will be exonerated. Uh, and uh, uh, I guess uh, this is how it's going to end. Two no, impeachments, it's, it's, but no convictions. But that, that's not how it ends, Jamal. How it ends is Trump is going to feel vindicated yet again. And you will see, and I'm, I'm sorry to say this, I predicted it, you know, in part of our predictions, you know, at the beginning of the year. The wrath, the craziness, the King Lear-esque narcissism of Donald Trump being even more, even more greatly inflamed at this time after this uh, trial is over because he's been quiet. His attorneys have told him, don't say anything, be quiet, don't do anything publicly. But after this trial is over, Jamal, I'm sorry to say that the full wrath and craziness of ex-president Donald Trump is going to be with us for a long time. I'm sorry to say that. Although the latest polls show that the majority, or, or not the majority, yeah, it's a majority of Americans actually see him... Um, as basically guilty, they they think that the the, the Senate should basically convict him. That's only fifty four percent in the poll that I saw, Jamal. So we still have this problem that about seventy four to seventy five million Americans believe that he did nothing wrong, uh, that he should go forward, and that he should not be convicted for his impeachment. I won't say it's seventy four million. The numbers that I saw, it's probably closer to like 50 million or 45 million. But he commands the loyalty of large number of Republican primary voters, which he will use as a bludgeon against anybody who votes against him. And I think, you know, the best outcome of this, Jamal, is that it destroys the Republican Party. That That's the best outcome. And then it has to reconfigure itself. The worst outcome is that you see a further extremist uh, uh, evolution of the Republican Party into this extremist right wing white supremacy, you know, um, party that it's become a QAnon party, a party that believes in uh, these psychotic conspiracy theories and people that's, you know, tens of millions of people, Jamal, who still believe Donald Trump won the election. So if the that's the worst case scenario. And after this impeachment uh, trial is over, we have to, you know, as a government has to take care of the economy, has to take care of COVID, has to take care of immigration. We're, we've got a lot of issues that this country has to, has to confront. But uh, make no mistake, Jamal, you will be hearing about Donald Trump every single day for the foreseeable future after this trial. Well, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, but people are, have started talking about the, the GOP splitting into two. There is the Mitt Romney GOP, and then there is the Donald Trump GOP. Right. I mean, and which one is going to win? Basically, what direction? Are they going to move way to the right or to Who the knows? left or to the center? We don't know. We have a few minutes, Jess. Uh, we, as usual, we update our uh, viewers and listeners about the COVID in the States. Uh, uh, what I've been seeing recently is, or at least uh, that we're showing a downturn. That's in, the good news. In the cases. That's good news. Is, uh, good news. There was one day, I don't know if this ha happened twice, but there was one day that the Biden administration claims that uh, they vaccinated 2 million people instead of 1 million people. So the number of vaccinations is going up. And then you have uh, the authorized now vaccination at the big drug stores like Walgreens and, and CVS. So it seems, you know, and, and actually California vaccinated 5 million people. So there are some milestones being set Yet, um, you know, the danger is still there, big, big danger because of the different strain that uh, of the virus that kind of uh, moves right. very quickly between people. 
So where are we at now? I would say that we're at a very, very dangerous and critical moment, Jamal. Right now, it's a race between getting people vaccinated and the mutations from UK, Brazil, and South America. And now that, you know, we have a California mutation, it's a race between getting people vaccinated and these other mutated uh, versions of the COVID uh, virus getting out of control. And that's really why it's such a dangerous period. If we don't get on top of vaccinating people very, very quickly, and the mutated viruses take control, we're in for a very long, dark period of time. Now, having said that, the, the potentially really good news is no matter what vaccine you get, if you get it, it will protect you from you know dying and it will protect you from developing serious symptoms. But this thing could continue to spread. I mean, you saw the pictures of Tampa uh, after the Super Bowl of peop- thousands of people partying without masks. So we are still living in a country, Florida, even parts of Southern California, Texas, where they have lifted restrictions, Jamal. And I still see pictures every day of people out there not wearing masks. So the race now is getting as many people vaccinated before the variants get out of control. And that's really where we're at right now. If the variants get out of control, as I said, we're in for a really long, dark period of time. Well, on this note, uh, this is Arab Talk on KPO San Francisco. You've been listening to us for the entire hour. And uh, to download our latest episodes, if you missed them, go to our website, arabtalkradio.com, and we will talk to you next week. We'll see you next week.